cover a bunch oh. of their songs. I still didn't cut, do cut, cut. We're going ah. live. We're going live. Oh dear. You left till us next time. Hmm. Just getting started. Yay! Oh, my gosh, so, so much applause! So much applause. Today. There. Galleries. There we are. That's it. Pum, pum, right? Pum, 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 pum. Share my screen. And Happy Good Friday, Friday, everyone, Bruce. by the way. For those of us, you know, Good Friday's a thing. Um, yeah. Grab the host, good Bruce. Friday. Grab and the I host, think there are some who would argue that uh, Fridays are always good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, there we go. And then we get that. Da -da -da -da. Well, this is something I came across. This is kind of interesting, I thought. This is this is from a collection at the Met, I guess. They've released all sorts of high resolution digital images of their collection. This is part of their collection, and it's a celestial globe with clockwork. It's a clock. Hmm. A celestial globe. Celestial globe, yeah. So yeah, it just sort of shows you where stars. the stars and, and all the different uh, constellations are. Yeah. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. Which, which it, to uh, me, it, it seems a little yeah. odd because you'd think, well, I guess really it kind of revolves around us over top. So I guess it just depends on where you're standing on the right. earth and how it's pivoting and such. So Celestial cool. sphere and drove a small image of the sun along the path of the ecliptic. And how cool is that? Neat. I, I want one of these, but I think it's kind of expensive. <laughs> I, it might be out of your price range. It's it no Batman be. toy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, hmm. Anyway, uh, things people have done over the years. Huh? I guess that's maybe that's our next thing of, of interesting things people have done in the past, in the far, far past. I, I'm always astonished when you look at something like this and realize how much effort somebody put into creating this thing. Just astonishing. Yeah, I agree. But you know, they didn't have uh, YouTube and Facebook and <laughs> yeah, yeah. the internet. It was instant gratification, <laughs> like they did. But if they had time to create things back then, <laughs> if you get into clocks, and I'm going to butcher this now because there's a, there's a famous clock maker from way way back when, and he spent like 17 years building his first clock, and then he spent like 20 years building the second clock, and he was an amateur clock maker, so he wasn't doing it for money. Um, he was doing it to make perfection. Mm. And um, you, know, you know the clock ran. He, he made one clock that's still running like 120 years later. Wow. It hasn't stopped. It's made completely out of wood. Um, it, it just it just boggles the mind the things these guys did. Yeah, we yeah. don't. You know. What if that's the same the same person? I saw there was a um, TV show called Connections, and it showed connections between things like this guy who's making a super accurate clock and ships at sea because ships at sea needed yeah. super accurate clocks same same <laughs> guy yeah you know. same guy and, yeah. and i forget his go. name um i read i read his uh, a book on uh, biography so yeah there was a big prize for for accurate clocks that work at sea because from the, you need the time to work out your position or your long, right? one of your distances the other one the latitude i want to say is the up down you can work out from the sun and the yeah, stars, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but the longitude you can't, you need to know the time. And back in the day, they had pendulum clocks and pendulum clocks don't work on boats. Mm -hmm. So um, they needed clocks and they need to be like properly accurate because if it drifts out by more than a few seconds, then your position is radically different. So yeah, potentially um, hundred miles. Huge price, huge price. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, he, he invented, um, Ocean going chronometers um, that would allow boats to literally know what longitude they're on and um, change the world. 
I mean, you know, you, yeah. you, you kind of think how valuable is GPS to oh, cargo yeah. ships, to airplanes, to everything we do, right? All commerce. Well, that was the equivalence of what mm -hmm. he did. Um, yeah, same guy. Cool. There you go. We get, we we connected there, Bruce. We yeah, connect. You just got there. And then next week, I'll I'll, I'll look up his name. I've, I um, yeah, I've forgotten his name. A lovely little book that uh, details his life. All right, history lesson over. Let's move on. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in Clarion Live land. This is the Clarion Live Weekly webinar. See it and learn it and share it. This is webinar number six hundred and fifty-six. <sighs> Today is April like a lot. 15th. It does sound like a lot. 2022. The clearing date is 80827. All webinars are recorded and available at clearinglive.com. And actually, a lot of them are available at uh, YouTube now. Join us on Skype. And uh, we are live streaming right now to YouTube. Three people are watching. Only one person likes what they're seeing so far. So let's see if we can. Um, maybe we need to create more drama, Bruce, like we did. Done. Last, done. Week. Done. Yes. <laughs> Last week. The world's most boring webinar. That's right. Yeah, well, that that was the non-drama one. Yeah, we need to, <laughs> I need to disagree with you more on things. I think that's what I yeah. need to do. Yeah, you see, and I'm yeah. only here for a short time because Good Friday. Uh -huh. So yeah. I'm afraid Mike is gonna is gonna get away with a lot tonight. It's not gonna be, you know, all those controversial things he talks about, like code. I'm just gonna, shoom, <laughs> it's gonna get away with it. I'll disagree with them. Maybe we'll get those likes up. Oh, we got two likes now. We're doing better. All right. Yeah, you see. Um, <laughs> four. We have it's up to four now. Myself. Now, what you should say, John, you should say, we need more yeah. controversy, Bruce, more arguments. And I say, no, we don't. <laughs> yes, we do. That's not our argument. No, we don't. <laughs> Both of you are it's wrong. It's just a contradiction. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> no, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. It's a, no, it isn't. Yes, it is. Um, okay, I'm the host. One more of them. Hey, for me. Bruce Jackson's here with me just for a short time. Hey. Andy Wilson's not with us at all. No, he's at Le Chateau. That's right. And Mike Hansen is with us today. Thank goodness. Because Happy to be here. He's doing. And thank you to that guy in the back. He keeps coming and he keeps giving me the clap. I like he's it. always here. He's following you around from city to city. He's my stalker. All right. We have rules. Um, all attendees are muted. At least we can't hear you. Type your questions into the questions box and we will read them to the presenter. If you want to speak, we encourage you to do so. Raise your hand. Type in the questions box. Finally, landing on Go doesn't double your earnings. I don't know of anybody out there who's played where you land on go you get like 400 dollars instead of 200 never heard of that but, but no you don't you only that. get 200 oh i've i've played people who do that no okay so is it double your earnings or double your bank like like your balance well go your earnings are 200 dollars every time you go around the board you earn ah, oh i so see a 400 instead of, i thought like whatever i've got sitting in my kitty whatever i yeah, should just be no, doubled no no no, 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 no. be good i like that yeah no, many people play that when if you if you land on Go itself that you get four hundred. Mm, okay, but, yeah, no, 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 I had not heard of that one, but that sounds like a fun rule. Yeah, but it's not a rule. <laughs> the rule is you only get two hundred. What is a rule? It's just not in the rules. I think most of these rules were made not up official. by parents who just wanted the game to go faster. Because the oh, thing about monopoly yeah, games maybe. is they all they play out on. exactly yeah, the play. same way, and so. You know, why have it lost four hours when you can have it last half an hour? And the faster way to do that, get rid of the money, get everyone rich very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then we can move it along a bit, bit more well, pace in the game. We'll find out in South Africa when uh, we have the first <laughs> annual. <laughs> first World Monopoly, Monopoly uh, yeah. Clarion Tournament. Huh? Exactly. All right. Feature presentation. Mike Hansen's doing the thing on Tacky. And look, coming soon, absolutely nothing. I'm thinking of calling the entire month of May off. Just not, just call it off. Don't do it. Don't do it. We can fill in April, and I'm sure. May, the month of mystery. The month of nothing. Okay. Yeah, we need people to step up and uh, volunteer and do some things. There are lots of things going on, lots of things happening. Top, I know there's people Top Gun 2 released stuff. on May 27. Okay, so we should take that Apparently, to sure. Apparently, <laughs> we'll, we won't know for sure until we get there. It's been released well, like 6, 10 times already. May 6 is Doctor Strange, so we should take that day off. Mm. So that just leaves the 13th and the 20th. Someone's got to have a birthday in there somewhere. We can take that day off. Well, of course, <laughs> and of course, we don't want to be here in May the 13th because it'd be t desperately unlucky mm. to be here then. So Yeah, we got to pay attention to the numbers. So uh, the 13th is off. And so the 20th has got to be someone's birthday. So this is the entire month of May. Things to do. Can't make it. <laughs> it has to be somebody's birthday. What it's if nobody has a birthday in the 20th? Wouldn't that be amazing? What are the, um, what are the odds? Yeah, initial. Uh, very low. low. <laughs> very, very low. low. I think the odds of um, 
of a classroom of 30 children having two of them having the same birthday on the same day is are very high. It's, it's 50% like five or something. Or something. Yeah. 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 It's no, very, no, very that's quite high. high. It's very, very, very yeah, stupidly high numbers, like one in 50 or, or, or yeah. like a 50 one chance. In, one, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no, it's, it's it's statistics, probability. Yeah. Statistics. Yeah. All right. Anyway, if you want something to watch those days, somebody needs to show up <laughs> and and give us something to watch or present something or talk about I something. I volunteer Andy. Uh, Andy actually does want to do one soon. So I think he'll probably do one on the 29th, I was expecting. Or the 6th, one of those two days. And May the 6th, by the way, is a free comic book day. First weekend in, actually the 7th, first uh, Saturday in May. So if you have a comic book store, you should be able to go down there now because we can go to stores now and get your free comics. Uh, uh, I do it every year and I dress up. Just, what's just a comic book you. store? Just, that's just the <laughs> thing. We, we, don't, we don't have them there. No. Uh, here. All right. No, no, no. Not a thing. Okay. So we did this coming soon. It's not much. Yep. Move forward. Uh, CIDC 2020 Africa in 2022, ever more likely than not. It yep. says. Looking good. Looking good. Dum, right. dum, 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 dum. So Bruce, we should have a meeting on it, I suppose, and get some emails together. And... We're gonna we're gonna start um, thrashing out some details. I've booked my flights already, um, so that's that's good. And um, booked yeah. your flights. Yeah. Where are you flying? You're flying out. You're not gonna be there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm getting out of dodge. <laughs> no, yeah, you know, you, I you got, decided I you're not going here to attend. To there. Yeah, to there. It's here to there. So, <laughs> so okay. Uh, I think you can just drive. Probably you could just walk. Well, yes, but you know, arriving by helicopter is more dramatic. So, oh, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> do that. Do that. <laughs> Arrive on the roof. Start sweet. that kind of hotel. Oh, uh, okay. Announcements. Uh, just at the top of the announcements here, I wanted to tell everybody there is no Niantis user group meeting this week. There is no NetTalk user group meeting this week. There is only an open webinar, and who knows what's going to happen on the weekly webinar? Something probably. Okay, anyway, so uh, there was a no answers this week, though, and Andy was there, and he had to make it kind of short, as I recall, and he helped some people, and off it went. <laughs> there was an open <laughs> webinar. <laughs> now it right down there, John. I like yeah. the way you uh, cut right to the chase. Damn. Things happened, and it was over. And then there was an open webinar, and who was there? Mike was I, not there. I wouldn't let you show Bruce stuff. Was there. I remember that. I was not there. Mm. That's right. I wanted to show stuff. I've got, um, Mike, I've made progress on hmm. Classify It. Cool. And I was going to sneak peek it on Wednesday. And Bruce goes, no, no, no. Wait till Friday. So here it is Friday. But I'm not going to sneak peek it unless there's room, unless there's time at the end of the webinar. I'll do it then hmm. if there's time. And if there's not, then I won't. I'll make you wait till the next. Well, Mike, Mike webinar. is famous for ending early, so you should. Well, you, should you know what? I, I'm right doing a topic time. today that we can do as little or as much as we want, so we can so, we can wrap it up. What I hear is time, he's do or just make it into seven sessions. You know, whatever, whatever <laughs> works. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to show it to you, Mike, because you it has some things in there that you've requested. So. Oh, well, I, I, I certainly have a lot of preferences and a lot of ideas, so I, I would be happy to see that some of those come to fruition. Many have been implemented. Uh, excuse me. One's a very, is, is a big one, I think. Hmm. But uh, cool. anyway, may or may not see it later today. Hmm. And um, I'm kind of wanting to release it, but Andy's wanting to release a new thing. I might release it as a beta. I mean, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. People are anxious to see it, I think. I get I get letter. I get I get an email. You get once letter. In a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I get uh, letters. Letter. Just, just so, one. <laughs> yeah, we, we, I pay attention to letter because <laughs> it's so unusual. All right. Um, and then there was a net talk user group. Bruce was there. It was, was and uh, we spent some time with Albert um, trying to track down a problem he's having with a put. And uh, um, actually, we didn't. We got quite some distance in, but then kind of called it a night. And uh, fortunately, I did figure it out. I was online with him today, and we figured it out. Um, and it's kind of he's doing something a little unexpected, but not wrong, just a little unexpected. So um, I've made a tweak for the next build, which will allow him to be more unexpected. Um, Victor had some CSS questions. We went through that quite quickly. We talked about session cleanups with Edward. 
And uh, Chris was getting a, a message about maximum number of instances exceeded. I showed him how to reset that. So yeah, we kind of got through quite quickly, about an hour and a half. And uh, we're all done and dusted. It's quite a good one. Excellent. And then next week, we don't know what's going to happen. Something, no. maybe. All right, so we are here. We are at the feature presentation. I can't think of anything else we need to talk about before this. So, oh, here we go. Here you go, Mike. <laughs> Very happy to be here. Sorry, I was just <laughs> answering a message, got distracted for a second. Um, but uh, I'm back in the land of living here now. Very happy to be here. So today we're going to talk about tagging. We'll just leave the screen up for a second. And, and when I say we'll talk about tagging, uh, specifically, I had a customer ask me uh, how to do such and such a thing with tagging. And I thought, oh, this is kind of an interesting little thing because you could slice it a whole bunch of different ways. And what they wanted to do is they, they had a situation where they had a list of products and they wanted to go through the list of products and tag some number of them and then um, have it automatically create an order for them. Uh, but it was a bit more involved. They wanted to, to, to have it automatically as they tag things, they wanted them to appear on a separate little list box so that they could say, here are the things that I tagged so they could see this ever growing list of, of items on their list. And then they wanted to be able to go over to that list and then change each one to say, I'd like it to change maybe the price or change the quantity from the default of one to some other number. So there are a bunch of neat little working parts in here. And, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be neat to try and look at how to solve that particular problem? And the interesting thing about it is I gave him just a few pointers to, based upon a, a rough idea as to how he might want to do it. And then he proceeded to take that and then took it in a different direction that I even expected him to do. So uh, I just wanted to talk about some of the pieces that you'd have to put in place to, to make this kind of thing work uh, with super tagging. So we're going to take uh, Clarion's uh, very awful invoice example, and we're going to add that kind of functionality to it in a variety of different ways and try and learn well, some things about how tagging works. And some of this stuff should be old hat uh, if you happen to have used tagging already. Uh, but I think you'll be, even if you're a, a tagging veteran, I think you might learn a little bit from this. And for those people who have never seen super tagging, you're about to see how amazing it is. And with that, we will proceed onwards. Let me share my screen, find the fancy button here. And it's this screen we want. And go. So here we have, and let me just uh, quickly compile and run this thing. Here is Clarion's awful invoice screen. Uh, one thing I did do, I, I made one small change. I went in and, and changed all the fonts. So if, uh, if we're looking at products, for example, uh, this at least is big enough that we can see it on screen. Uh, the original, it was, uh, I think MS saw serif and eight point and, and it was just awful. So I just went through and changed everything to Seago UI 12, uh, 12 point, which I think is a little easier for us to see. This is the generic stock example. This does not have anything uh, as far as super tagging yet. So we're gonna go through the whole process of adding super tagging to this application and it's not too difficult to do. The first thing we need to do is we have to add the tagging files to the dictionary. So we're going to just close the app temporarily here. We're going to go to the applications list. We're going to highlight this and we're gonna hit the little dictionary button. It'll automatically load the dictionary for the app. And then we are going to import screen thing here. Which one of these is import? There we go. Import, import dictionary from text and we'll go over to S source so ABC tagging. And we're going to grab tagging.txt and bagging bang. And here we have now three files. And, and I'll just quickly explain what these files are for. Tag set is uh, is a set of tags. Basically says here's a collection of tags with a particular tag table number. And if you're using a security system, the user number that the tags belong to. Uh, extra information as far as uh, what is the uh, the source, the procedure that created it, for example, that could kind of thing could be in there. Description of what the tags are uh, and then the date they were created and how many tags are sitting here in the set. And 
what's going to happen is um, we, I think we're going to make use of these tag sets at some point just for, for fun in our process. Um, now, tags can be stored in one of three different places. Uh, the original tagging way, way back uh, with uh, Clarion for DOS, uh, or actually, I guess at the time it was called the Clarion Professional Developer. Uh, when I first created the, uh, the uh, public domain models, which then became the super models, the first ever instance of tagging, we just made the system flip a byte field in the in, in your file. Uh, so if you were tagging customers, there'd be a field in there called tag. Uh, and it would just toggle that on and off when you tag things. <clears throat> and before too long, people said, well, that's not going to work. That doesn't support multi-user access, which is why we brought in this concept of, of the tag file. The tag file says for a given user and a given table number, um, what is the pointer value? Or in the case of, of something else, it could be uh, what is the uh, the, the uh, uh, and, and then this value, it, it, this is just an extra value it would, it would save along to try and figure out some kind of an identifier of what the tags were. If we wanted to happen to process just tags later, uh, this might be the uh, the first few letters of a person's name or something would get thrown into there. But this is kind of an extra superfluous field. And of course, we ran into the problem that not everybody's everybody was using pointers uh, or longs. Uh, to to have their UIDs. So then we added this other file called tag file pos. And here, instead of the pointer, it has a position of string 256, where it can actually store a, a much larger uh, ID in here. And this stores potentially the position of the file, that kind of thing, so which is why they call tag file pos. And now instead of storing the position, it actually will store the uh, the actual UID. Uh, in uh, in that form, so uh, so that's one uh, another option to store tags is you can store them in these disk files. And the nice thing about storing them in the disk files is they're permanent. And you know, sort of get stored out there in disk, and then you come back in the next day, start up the program, and there are all your tags still sitting there. Isn't that nice? And of course, if you save a tag set, a set of tags are going to be stored uh, as as the header, and then all of the tags either in tag file or tag file pos. So that's the second way to store tags, and there's really two different additional ways to store tags beyond toggling a field in the file. Uh, and then the final way to store tags is in memory. Uh, and the system automatically it maintains some queues internally. And of course, that's very, very fast. It's very handy, but of course, it goes away when you turn off your program. So depending upon your needs, you've got a lot of flexibility as far as, far as, as, far as how you use these tags. Uh, you'll notice there are some relationships. This thing is, is related to both tag file and tag file pos, so you can process things correctly. So we have now got those in the dictionary, and you've got a bit of an idea as to how tags might be stored. Let's go ahead and save that. And let's go back into the app. The next thing we need to do is go into global extensions and insert search for tagging. And here we have tag global. And you'll notice there are no options here. There used to be options to say, where do you want to store your tags? You, where's the tag file? Is the tag file generated by the template? Or is it in the uh, dictionary itself? And I decided after a while, you know what? Let's just pull, always pull the files into the dictionary. There's no reason why you wouldn't want to do that. Uh, so all this does is just basically say, now I can understand the concept of how to do tagging. And all the necessary libraries and everything else are brought in by this one piece. Nothing else necessary to figure out. Let us then go I, in. Yeah. There's a question for you. Oh, OK. Uh, so I was wondering if um, the tag files can be defined and used in an SQL backend. Most definitely they can. So if, and all you need to do is just like any other data file, uh, you just go into uh, the file settings and here's the file. And then you just change your, you know, change to MS SQL, so on and so forth. Or SQLite. Or SQLite or whatever, yeah. Whatever you want, yeah. Yeah. So absolutely, yeah. It's a data file at that point. So do whatever the heck you want to do with it. Uh, and I have to admit, some of my users actually, for whatever reason, decide they want to keep the file, the tag files as top speed files um, and, and just go from there. Or as you say, they change them to SQLite or use the in-memory driver too. You know, there's all kinds of options, but it is now a data file in your dictionary. Do whatever the heck you want to do with it. 
just gonna get out of here. No, I don't want to save those changes. Back into here. And we are going to do this now. The way let's just look at how this application works and see where we might want to drop this into place. So normally what happens is we can browse all customers' orders. So this is a very odd way of defining this thing. So I, I don't think we want to do anything here. That's just weird. Uh, browse customer information. Oh, well, that's kind of handy. And then if we do this, there's the customer record. Show me the orders of the customer. Ah, this is a good place to be. So, so this is the customer. This is all their orders. And we've got a button to print an order. I think from this screen, we want to say, I want to add another order. How do we add another order to this? There we go, insert. And then it comes into a detail record and then just immediately goes to add that one. Select product there. Is that what it's doing here? This is a weird application there. Got to select product save. This record has been added. You want to add another record? What a wonky interface this thing is. Um, yeah, this is terrible. Um, so we've now created, the, we create another order. What have we done here? Insert another, or ah, I see what happened. I just ordered, added one item to the, to the thing. So here we're adding another order. So what we're going to do is we'll, we'll add another button where we can create a new order by selecting products. Uh, is what we're going to do. And we'll do it from the screen. <coughs> so uh, let's go ahead and just add a button to do that. So browse orders, browse customers, browse orders. This is probably the screen here. Bingo. Okay, so let's just take this button and move it over here. And Skype, don't, not going to worry about that one for now. And then let's just copy this button. Sure, there, lovely. And then we're gonna change the use variable here. Let's just change it over to um, new, okay, order from tags. There, just for something like that. Uh, da, da, da. And then we're going to change the, let's change the, the icon, something better. I don't know. Doesn't really matter what we call it here. Oh, actually, you know what? I could do it like this. Let's use the tagging, uh, one of the tagging things. Oh, no, you know what? Doesn't matter. Let's just use an ellipsis there. Good. Why not? Uh, it doesn't matter which icon we have for that. Uh, in fact, we could even just put text on there if we wanted to. Uh, but for now, it's just going to be there. Does this thing have a tip? Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, create new order by tagging products. There, good. And then we are going to uh, call actions and we're gonna say embeds. And this is the one of the few times I'll actually go into the embed tree. I, I very rarely go into this thing. The only reason I want to do this is I want to do accepted and we're just going to say source and we're going to say Clark there. Just some text to look for. And we will looking for Clark. And what do we want to do? We want to say select uh, uh, no, we're not doing select. We're going to be calling select uh, select products as the name of the procedure we're going to call. So we're going to change the products selection box so that it can do tags as well. Uh, and then we are going to uh, say uh, global request equals select uh, record. And then we're going to do um, and, and I'm, I'm currently breaking a rule that I, uh, that I never want to do, and I'm going to immediately fix this. I'm starting to say, hey, what's all this code in this of blah, blah, blah. That's a terrible place to put it. Uh, let's just say do, uh, and we're going to say order 
from tags. Why not? There. And then we need to find the routines section. Here's routines, start procedure routines there. Much better place to put it. And the reason I'm doing this like this is because the worst place to put code is into your window structure uh, where you're grabbing all the events from that because it means you're kind of gluing it into that location forever. As soon as you say, now this is a separate thing, then your brain starts thinking of it in the concept of saying, maybe it doesn't even belong here. Maybe it's going to be in a, a separate procedure entirely. But the fact that I've created the separate thing means you think of it as a distinct item like that. So it's more of a mindset thing. Just, just don't put a whole lot of code up in that, uh, up in your event handling uh, structures. It's just, it, it tends to just glue it into the wrong place. And then later when you decide, I want to create a, a web store API thing to call in and do that logic. And you're like, oh gosh, this logic is just so transfixed within this one spot you can't even figure out how to extract it out at that point. And then you end up saying, oh, you know what, let's just copy and paste it over to there. And now you've got two kind of sort of same bits of logic in two places. And that's just a horrible, horrible idea. So is wherever possible, pull stuff out, stick it somewhere like this. So select products and, uh, and let's start by doing that. And then we'll just put a little pin here to do. So it's select products that we are working on. And just for the sake of doing this, let's make sure that this thing knows it is calling select products. So just do that. And that's now showing up in our tree, which is always nice. Here's the select products browse. And here we have, I don't know what this query thing is. Huh, I wonder what that does. Uh, embeds. Is there anything in there? No, what does that button do? Uh, is it, it must be a template. Actions, QBE options. So it's some, some kind of query stuff. I don't know what the, what, what the query thing is, but there's a select button that, that essentially that we're, we're doing here. So we're gonna make a couple minor changes to this. Let's just make the screen a little bit bigger. Oh, and it looks like this screen was never changed. So let me show you really quick what I did when I, uh, just to take the font stuff out, super, super simple. I just come to here and I just change this to say Sego. UI, I change this to 12 and I search for the word font and see if it's anywhere else. So that one's, there's it's doing some red and bold. Oh, here's another one we got to change and we just rip this out because of course, when you're editing stuff in the uh, window editor, a lot of times it accidentally tags on the font stuff that you really don't want it to touch. That's good. Now, if we go back into the window, you'll notice it looks much prettier there. That's the way it should look. So I'm going to make this a little bit bigger here. I guess I can leave this like this for now. And what in the world thing is this? It's the tab, or is the sheet? Not the sheet. There, there. Make that a little bigger so we can fit more stuff on it. I'm going to take this select button and bring it down here. Move this down to here and make this like this here. Sure. Lovely. Uh, that's a little better because I just want people to see the select button. And I think right now it's probably told to hide if we're, uh, yeah, hide it when the select button is not applicable. That's fine. And it's like, okay, good. Um, and then there and use Visual Studio. And it's hidden anyway. I don't want it hidden. And why in the world is this bold? That's just ugly. Okay, much better. Good. All right. So we are going to now add tagging to this thing. So let's go ahead and look in the control templates. And we're going to go tagging. Where's tagging? Tag. Browse up tag filter, QBE form, browse on products. There we go. Except there's not that super tagging, super QBE. Hold on, that's not what I want. Browse tagging down here. So here we are, the browse tagging ABC. Here's our browse tagging buttons attached to browse on products. And that's what we want. We're just gonna click in here, bang, and we'll get a whole bunch of buttons. And just 
I'm gonna grab this here and just move these over. Well, actually, we'll take this one here and move these down. And what happens when you add tagging to a browse is it says, these are all of the operations that you can do, but all of these things are going to be hidden at, at runtime. Uh, although it's optional, if you want, you can actually see all these buttons, but I find this just makes the screen way too noisy. So they're here mostly just so that you recognize those things exist. And let's say you decided, I don't want them ever to do flipping of a tag. That just seems weird to me. You could just come in and delete those three buttons and then it just won't support flipping um, and browse uh, jumping to the previous tag to the next tag that's a handy little navigation feature that uh, they're sometimes useful uh, or tagging the rest to say oh from this point downwards i want you to tag everything beyond that point very handy in some cases maybe it doesn't apply in a particular browse so you can rip off all of the rest buttons there if you want to but for now, let's just leave them all on here. We're going to right click on one of these things and we're going to say actions. Actually, you know what, before we start fiddling here too much, let's just, I'm just going to put a one there for now. Um, I just want to save this thing because of course, you know, as soon as you touch a window, Clarion likes going weirdo on you. In fact, just for fun, I want to make sure that I really get it back to square one here. So we'll go there might still blow up on me at some point, but usually just saving it makes a big difference. Modified and it's select we're on. Da, da, da. And we'll go right click and we'll hit actions. Now it's asking, where are the tags stored? And the default option is memory set, stored somewhere in memory. And in most cases, that's probably just fine. Disk set can be useful, as I said, if you want your tags to have permanence. Um, if they come back tomorrow, you want the tags still to be there. I would think for this particular operation, you probably don't want to do that, but who knows? Now, the thing to make to take note of here, and then of course, byte field and primary nowadays is a pretty bad choice unless you happen to have an app that's only being used by one person or you want that tag to be seen by everybody. You know, if somebody tags it, user number one tags it, user number two needs to see that it's tagged as well. Maybe that has a significance in the way that you want to use this. The point is, it's really up to you as, as far as how you set this. But for this purpose, we're going to leave it for tag set. And here it's asking for a tag set number. And the thing to recognize here is, uh, usually a tag set number would correspond to a particular type of thing that you're tagging. So in this case, we're tagging products, but it doesn't have to. Uh, you could have, you, you could tag products for a hundred different reasons. Maybe I'm tagging the products for the sake of printing off a report. Maybe I'm tagging the products for the sake of creating a new order. Who the heck knows why, why you'd want to use them. But if there are multiple independent operations that you want to perform, while tagging products, uh, then you can create a different tag set number for each of those. This number also could doesn't necessarily have to be exactly for, for, for products. So you have to be somewhat careful. You don't want to tag set number one and associate it with products and then also use tag set number one for customers because tag set number one is tag set number one, period. It doesn't know anything about products or customers. It's just a collection of tags, a co collection of numbers associated with the number one. Uh, so what I normally do, I pretty much insist that people do something like this, uh, if they're at all forward thinking, is use some kind of equate here. And, and the, the standard that I tend to use is small e uh, for equate, capital T, and then I do an underscore just as a, as a bit of a delimiter, and then I might say product. So we have to define this equate somewhere. So I'm just going to go ahead and save this for the moment. And let's go ahead and create this right now. So we're going to say new standalone file, uh, standalone member file, create. And we're going to save this file. And it's in the right place. And let's call this file e, all right, let's call it tag set.eku. Sure, why not? Good name. And we want to create a nice little thing here. And what I normally will do is I won't even give it an explicit number. So I'm going to say itemize, lovely thing here for this. And we want to start with a value of one. And this is just going to say equate. So ET product just by default becomes number one. 
the, the, the trick here is if you actually want these things to have a meaningful value. For example, if you were storing them in, in a tag set file and you wanted to remember that number one was this, number two was that, you might want to give it an explicit value. Um, if you're afraid that you'd accidentally change the order of these at some point and have them stored off on your on your file somewhere, and in this situation, it might be it might be wise just in case because maybe you want to have these things alphabetically. So later, I'm going to have E T customer equate number two, and if that's the case, eh, maybe it's wise to do it like this instead. So now you know that customer tags are always going to be tag set number two, product will be number one, you happen to create that one first, but this list is in alphabetical order, isn't that nice? So let's do it that way. And again, it's really up to you. Any number you want to assign is perfectly fine. So now that we've got that, we have to make sure that this file is actually created and included. So we're going to go back into our app, we're going to go to Global Embeds, we're going to say after global includes this is a wonderful place to put this. And we're going to say source and we're going to say include tag set dot eq once. And then let's go back to the application. Let's go to extensions. Let's see what other options we've got in this extension, which you'll notice the extension is associated with a browse. So if you had multiple browses on your window, every single one of them could have its own tagging abilities. Not a problem whatsoever. So memory set is what we're using still for the moment. ET product, just like we used. Tag display. How do you want your tags to be displayed? Well, as, as a default, it assumes you want to have text appear like a star or something in that field. But personally, I don't like that. So I always change this over. Do um, you want to see blank with a check mark? Well, my preference is actually a box with a check mark. But there's a bunch of other options. Do you want to see a box with, with an X or a cross or a square, maybe a circle with a dot or an X? I, you know, or you can specify whatever the heck icons you want for is this tagged and not tagged. So I'll say box with check mark. That's my personal preference. Do you want to override the tag width? Uh, the tag width as a default attempts to look at the height of your list rows and then sets the tag column to be the most appropriate size for that. And it usually is about 1.4 times your row height. So if your row height is set to 10, it's you're normally going to set it to 14 DLUs, for example. And it figures that out at runtime. But for some reason, you might want your tag column to be a little bit wider. So you can say, no, 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 use this number. So that's what that's for. Here we go with the buttons. Do we want to duplicate the tagging buttons on the pop-up menu? Almost certainly you would want to do that, yes. And I don't want to see those big, ugly buttons. So let's just hide those. Uh, do you want to automatically add the icons to the buttons? Um, that's in the situation where you say, I want to keep the buttons and I want you to be nice enough to add all the standard icons that are used for tagging uh, to the uh, to the left hand side of the buttons. Again, because we're hiding the buttons, we don't really care. Um, messages. Uh, there are various messages that pop up automatically. For example, when the window first opens, uh, you might have some tags that were hanging around from before. And if you do, uh, maybe you want to warn the user, hey, there are some tags here. Uh, do you still want them? Or do you want me to just clear it off to a new slate because you first came in? So the default is ask. Uh, or yes, I want to always get rid of them. Or no, I never want to get rid of them. Obviously, I never want. How are you even ask that question? Of course, I don't want to get rid of them. Everybody's got their own thing, so I try to be as flexible as I can. Um, but if we are going to ask, well, what question will you ask? Clear existing tags. There you go. Next, previous tag messages. Um, again, uh, the, you remember we had those two little buttons for navigating to the next tagged record, to the previous tagged record, because there might be a thousand records in your database and you've only got three, and you want to say, where was that other tagged record? I want to want to find it. So when you're jumping from tag to tag, Maybe we want to have a message pop up that says, hey, there's uh, there's no more of that direction. Sorry. Um, so you'll notice the message is the same in both cases, but maybe you want to have uh, there's no more tags after this one. There are no more tags before this one. You change it to something else if you want. Uh, miscellaneous things, a whole bunch of neat things. Do you want to click in the tag column to flip the tag? Well, of course I do. I'm going to have a little checkbox there. I'd love, love to click in that thing and have it toggle the tag. 
Do you want to scroll down after tagging? Some people, when they hit the tag button, they might press Alt T to tag a record and they want it to automatically move the selector down to the next record. So um, because of the way they like their tagging to feel, they could have it scroll down every time they tag a record. Generally speaking, I don't want that, but uh, the, I've used it myself occasionally. Um, restrict untag all only to visible records. And this is kind of an interesting one. As you know, a browse can have a selector, a browse can have filters. Uh, if the user says, I want to untag all the records, do you want it to say, oh, okay, I'll only untag the records that you can actually see an effect on this particular browse with its selector and filter. Um, that's what, what, uh, what this would do is it would just say, okay, I'm only gonna assume that you can touch these records, so I will only untag these records. But generally speaking, tagging operations in the background can happen, uh, can happen for an entire tag set. You can just say, I just get rid of everything to do with this tag set number. And that's the most efficient way. And, and most of the time it's just fine. Um, but uh, it, it's really up to you. Uh, I say it's slow. It's slow relative to saying get rid of all these tags for, for this particular tag set number. Um, so this is really completely up to you as to how you set that. Reselect list after bulk tagging operations. If you happen to have a, you were using the buttons and you said, I want to tag all, you want it to go back to the, to the list after it's finished tagging all. Um, that's normally a nice thing. Browse tagging is active condition. Um, this is in the situation where, you, where for whatever reason you decide that sometimes I want to be tagging, sometimes I don't. Um, and you can shut it off by just setting this here to say, you know what, for whatever reason, you, you, I don't want you to be doing tagging stuff right now. It doesn't apply in this particular mode that I've called this particular window. Um, record can be tagged condition. There are some situations where a, a given record should not be tagged. Maybe it's a special product that you you uh, you never want to let them select that product for this particular, uh, you know, in this case, we're creating a new order. Well, maybe there are certain products that they can see in the list, but we don't want to let them actually include that in a new order because there's something special about that. So you could have some condition which is calculated at runtime and says, oh, you try to tag that thing that can't be tagged. Sorry, that didn't work. And then some extra little things. We won't go into all these details. Uh, but there's there's some neat little things that are can, quite handy in certain situations. Uh, so we will hit OK here. And the, there's one more step we've got to do to make this work. We're going to, I think we'll just save that real quick. Let's go back to our window. Uh, of course, we want to be able to see the tag. So we're going to go, go into the list box format and we're going to add a new column. And the column is going to be from local data as a new field that it automatically adds called tag. And we're going to put that one right here and shift it back over to the other side. And I don't want to see this column and everything. I'd like to, it to just sort of look like it's near the description field. So we'll tweak this a little bit. We'll change the text to get rid of it completely. Uh, just for the sake of envision envisioning it, let's change the width to 14 because that's normally what it's going to be. Uh, let's turn off the data indent. Although really the, the templates are going to twiddle with a lot of these settings anyway. But let's just set it to 14 because we don't want to see the text. All we really care about is the icon. And let's turn on transparent icon. And there you go. And the reason I set this width to 14 and the data intent to 14 is I don't want to see the text at all. I just want to see whether there's a thing there. And then finally, I'm going to get rid of the right border. And I never want this to be resizable. So I'm just going to shut off all that stuff. And this screen is massive. Let's just do that. There, better. And now that you'll see that we have this tag column that's showing up on the left here. And let's go ahead and save that. And then let's run this and see if it works. And browse customers. And then let's go orders. And here's our little button. And this should pop up. And hey, look at that. Tag, tag, tag. We're now tagging. Isn't that fun? Looks pretty like it was supposed to be there in the first place. And let's go ahead and hit select. And of course it does nothing. And we knew that. Now let us now make it do something. Here we are, to do. 
Now, what would I like to do with this thing? Well, uh, at the very least, what I want it to do is I want it to, uh, to use those tags. So let's say uh, there, there's a bunch of neat little functions in here. And to know what these functions are called, uh, because there are a bunch of different ways you can store tags, there's a bunch of different ways that you can access those tags. And there are uh, procedures to handle that. And I think what I might do here is let's just say, uh, let's go back to our other procedures for a moment because I want you to, the easiest way to figure out which procedures you should be calling, let's just search for the word tag. And as we're jumping through, we're eventually going to find a call to a function. Uh, you know, let's search for tag open print. Oh, like that. Nope. Let's search for get tag or get tag. There we go. Over time, there were a number of different ways to, to access tags. The first was get tag to say, is a particular record tagged? You pass some parameters in there. That's if your tags were associated with a uh, the pointer or the uh, the primary ID was it was it a long, um, and that was when it stored on disk. So if you're using tag file underscore, it was get tag underscore, and that was the first and original. Then when we added the concept of well now we need a string, then we said it was called pos because originally it was position. Uh, so then we say get tag pos underscore open print. That was another one. And then uh, we had the concept of doing it from memory. Oh, okay, well, let's get tag colon pointer M. And there was get tag colon pos M. So those are the standard uh, standard structures. There's actually a class wrapper now that, that that's available that if you really want to use it, uh, you can just specify what the method is and, and it's a little bit more straightforward. But traditionally, we're still using these when we generate the code in the template. So the easiest way is to go in and just search for get tag and you'll find out that it's got whatever one is calling and it's that kind of operation you want to do yourself right there. So we can copy that entire thing. And then we can go back to here. And that is the prototypical call. And there's a whole bunch of neat little tagging functions we can do. So the one of the best ones is count tag. We want to count to see if there are any tags at all. So, um, and it's the tag product and we don't need that. We just say in this tag set, for this tag set number, are there any tags? So let's just go um, uh, stop that there. In fact, I want to go one thing more than that. Let's go um, um, global response. So what we're going to see is we're going to see what was the global response and uh, how many tags do we have? So let's just run this and see what happens. Customers, orders, that, and then uh, let's just hit cancel. Two, which is uh, basically not completed. Um, and zero, there are zero tags, ignore. Let's hit it again and let's hit uh, one, two, three of these guys and then let's cancel again. It's still two, which was canceled, but now there are three tags. So that's kind of cool. Uh, let's hit it again. Uh, clear existing tags, no. Uh, and then let's hit select. Now we have one, which is completed, three tags. Ignore, let's hit it again. Let's clear existing tags and then we'll just hit select. And now it's completed with no tags. The reason I wanted to show you this is that this is the kind of flexibility I normally like having in this thing. So we're going to go in here again. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say if global response equals request completed, then I want to do something. If count tag product is greater than zero, then let's do another thing. Let's go to create order from tags. 
else. And then here's something neat I'm going to do. I'm going to take this. Actually, you know what? Account. Let's do this this way. It's a little bit easier. Equals one. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, did we? Did the person say select? If they did, are there no tags? If there are no tags, then they probably are just selecting the one product, you know, versus hitting cancel to say, I've decided I don't want them at all. So the fact that they had select means I want to go forwards, but the fact that they didn't tag any means just this one. So if they haven't tagged any, then I just want to go ahead and tag the one that they just set. So here we go, set tag pointer M, ET product, blah, blah, blah. Now let's just check here because I want to make sure that the product file is actually good, it is. So I just want to make sure that we were, that the products file was still open because there are situations where you would call into that thing and it would open the product file for the browse, but then you came back and this particular browse doesn't need to access products. So just wanted to verify that it was somewhere in our box here. Uh, and if we were concerned that maybe someday they'd take away the detail browse and the products would go away, we could just explicitly say, hey, we really do want the products in here. Product, products are. So that's now in there for sure. Now, this is kind of a neat thing. What we're going to do here is we want to create this routine here. So I'm going to, just for fun, uh, for the sake of, of just keeping it separate, I normally wouldn't create, use a code template for this because I think the code's pretty straightforward, but I want to local objects, procedure routines. I'm going to add another embed and it's going to be called that. And then I'm going to add a code template. And the code template is going to be down here, tagging, tagging, there we go, tagging. I want to process tagged records, okay? And it's going to say, oh, uh, okay, let's go to the data pad window because it wants to make sure, you notice over here, we have this process tagged file has now shown up in our data pad, but we have no way to get from here over to there. So this is just a shortcut to get to the data pad from here. And then we now want to select to here and then here we go. And we're now going to uh, select, oh, I want to try that again, sorry, to here, add, and then we want products. And lo and behold, it turns out because I'm using this particular method, the fact that I added products as another file was unnecessary. But it's still useful to know that sometimes that's helpful. Uh, and as I said, again, usually I wouldn't use a code template to do this. There is a code template that writes the code for you. But once you see what the code looks like, you'll realize that you could probably write it faster than you could figure out how to use this code template. But some people just prefer using templates just in case. And that's why it's here. So we've now got products here. And you'll see that over here now, process tag, products is there. And of course, we have to specify ET uh, product. I think that's what it was called, wasn't it? Extension tag set product, yeah. I'll just go back and look at this again. And actions for process. What do you want to do? Well, do you want a condition that where it does it only when you happen to uh, uh, this condition is true. So it's going to process all those tags. Maybe it'll skip some because of some condition. No, there's no condition. Set up code. Is there something you need to do before you even get started? No, there's nothing about that. Uh, process code. What do we want to do? Well, we want to, I don't want to put the code right here. Say uh, add a product uh, to order. And, and you know what? There may end up actually being something that we want to do as a setup code, but we'll see. Um, and, and I'll show you what I mean in a second as to why I may not necessarily want to put it there. Uh, file operation, do you want to do anything to the product record that you are processing? So I'm basically going through and finding all of the products that are tagged. So it's going to load every single one of those products into memory for you. Uh, do you want to do anything to the product record itself? Well, not really. I'm actually going to be creating something else to, to manage that. And then once it's done all those things, do you want it to do uh, any final code? 
uh, after it's all done. Uh, perhaps we do, but I'm not going to do it here, and you'll see in a reason why. Uh, then, once it's done processing these tags, would you like to wipe the tags that you just used? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Do you want to reset the window? Maybe something's changed, so now the window needs to be refreshed. Sure, we could do that. Uh, do you want to select a particular control? Uh, because now that we've done this operation, I need to go somewhere. These are just helpful little things the code template is doing. Most of this stuff is superfluous, but whatever. It's there in case you need it. Now that I've done that, I'm going to save that and then go back into the embedder and you can see the code that it wrote. So it, it does a, a pretty nice job. It writes more code than you actually need to have it write. Uh, this is a real holdover from way, way back when. This is completely and totally useless now. Uh, but it does nothing. So it just it's in there still. One of these days I'll clear out the stuff, but uh, it's just extra code because at one point in time that was a necessary thing. So what's it doing? It first of all it just sets the cursor to the waiting. Um, it has this variable called s tag reference. It's just a string, or uh, sorry, a number in this case, n references. So it's a number reference. Notice the form of this thing is just first tag using pointer m. So it's just like we're using up here, set tag, count tag, get tag, first tag. Uh, there's this pattern of it always using one, two, three letters uh, to, to indicate the verb and the fact that it's working with tags. And then the last portion indicates the type. Of course, we're working with the product file. So it says, go get the first tag, please. Now, as long as there's a tag reference, I'm gonna keep going here. So it, as long as there's a tag, it proceeds onwards. It says, okay, the product number is going to be equal to whatever that reference was. And then it stores an error and a little implicit here and it calls access records or access products dot try fetch using the product key. So it's smart enough to realize that you are fetching it by this. Uh, and then um, uh, the if, if it was in a benign coming back from that, then it man, means we can actually do the stuff we're supposed to do for the record. So that's what it's going to do here, which means we're going to need this thing down here somewhere. And then finally, it says, OK, and now once you've done that, go get the next tag. Got the first tag to start off, and then you keep getting the next after that until you're done. Uh, and then it turns off the cursor, and then it calls this window.reset. So the question here is, what do we want to do? Well, the first thing we should probably do is do add um, order uh, header, because that needs to happen. Because these records that are going to be created need to be associated with something. So we're going to say um, access. Is it orders dot prime record? Uh, and then we're going to say access uh, colon orders dot insert there. Uh, a prime record, and we probably, and I think that'll automatically set the, uh, the, the incremented key for us. And then we're going to also say um, order. Is this in, it probably has a prefix of that. Customer number equals whatever this customer number is here. Cus, uh, number? I don't know what it's gonna be. Phone number, ID. Where's the customer number here? Customer number there. So we've now primed the record to get the next number. We've set the customer number to be this customer, and then uh, we're inserting the record. And now when we're adding the product to the order, we're just gonna do something similar, except now we're for products instead. And the file is products, prime record, insert, and then it's going to be PRO colon, yep. Order number, where's the order number in here? Product number, nope. Where's the order number? Record, 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 price. I'm blind here. Or sorry, product, I'm not in the right file. Items or whatever it is. What's the thing called? Detail. 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 
colon. Uh, order number, there we go, equals ORD. Order number, there. Okay, now that means this is um, access colon detail, there. Detail, there. That should do the trick. Oh, one other thing to say, DTL colon quantity equals one. Sure. Now there's a chance uh, that there is priming logic that is buried inside of the detail form somewhere, or somewhere else in an embed. Maybe it's in the dictionary, but this is probably close to what we need it to be. So let's go ahead and try running this and see what happens. Oh, actually, you know what we could also do is we could do um, uh, da, 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 da. let's go here and we're going to say date. We probably want the order date in here. Or date, order date equals today. Any other fields we might want to do here? Order ship, note. Uh, and again, this is going to be business logic dependent, so we don't need to go too crazy here. Let's just put in today's date. And let's try and run this. Browse, customers information. Uh, there we go. And then let's get orders and then let's go uh, insert and let's just pick bang, bang, bang and select. Adding a duplicate key, key details. Yeah, so obviously there's some extra fields that we have to make sure are, are specific. Ah, you know why? I know what's going on here. One, one, one. Which one do we just add? Is it 22? It's gotta be this one. That's interesting. Why did it add another order number one? Unless our, it wouldn't be assigning order numbers within a customer, would it? That would be bizarre. Let's check the dictionary. <laughs> oh my goodness, I hope not. That's a frightening concept. Uh, let's see here. It'll teach me for using Clarion's default <laughs> application. <laughs> okay, order. Uh, keys, uh, what do we got here? Order number. Well, what do you know? <laughs> that is bizarre. Oh my goodness. <laughs> what a frightening concept. Uh, okay. Um, all right. Well, that's um, fine. Yeah. Uh, no, no, we can, we can deal with this. All I have to do is just set the, key, set the customer number first. Uh, it's just funny. Uh, okay. So uh, now I just want to take a look at details real quick and see why it, it uh, didn't like this. Customer number. Ah, and that's why I got the duplicate. And line number. Ah, okay. Uh, so we have to make sure we assign the customer number and order number before we do a prime. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, okay. Uh, it's bad enough that they that they made the uh, customer number, uh, you know, they order numbered invoices within that. The fact that they've got the customer number on the detail record and it's part of the prime key. Oh my goodness. <laughs> The stuff you discover is amazing some days. Okay, let's go back into this. We'll tweak our code a bit and see if we can get this working. Okay, so uh, we could be able to solve this just by going like this and going with that. That probably would solve it. Uh, and then this thing, we're gonna move this up here. And then we're going to do something similar to this guy up here as a DTL. Let's hope it's customer number. And we'll find out shortly if it's not. Oh, that worked. Okay. Uh, so browse customers and order and add an order. And then let's go bang, bang, bang and then select and did it not update it where's our order odd i wonder where it went 
did it somehow lose the customer number? Or should I be using those? So there's two different primes. I might've used the wrong one. There's prime record and prime. That may be what I did wrong. Okay, prime. Suppress clear. Ah, yes, that's what I have to do. Okay, so here. Um, let's go clear order. Start off with just clearing it orders and then do that. And then we do the prime record like that. That's probably gonna solve it. Similarly, we're gonna go down to here and we're gonna prime uh, clear details and, or sorry, detail. And then we're going to do this here as well. I prefer that. Let's see if this works. Um, we probably created a couple of garbage records in our database. It's fine. Uh, browse, customers, orders, add one, two, three, select. Oh, there we go. Bing, bing, bing. So we obviously didn't prime everything we need to prime. The description should have been pulled in automatically, but I guess the description was pulled in as part of the normal selection process. We didn't bother defining that field, but, and the same thing with price and this and that. And, and I mentioned that earlier on that because of the logic of this program, there's a bunch of code that's sort of jammed into embeds here and there. So you want to do some, what would seem to be a generic priming exercise. And that code is buried somewhere in a bed rather than being in, in the dictionary, which would be a great place to put it or in some kind of a, a function we could call, but I highly doubt that that function exists. So it's not really necessary for us to, to go in and, and go too crazy with it. Maybe we'll grab uh, uh, the, um, well, let's just quickly go in here. So when I normally call the select products, let's do that here. Where select products called otherwise print selected customer browse products. Select product here. Okay. Select product. Let's see what happens after the product is selected. Completed. Oh, look at all this stuff. Okay. Um, so they've selected a product. So let's just take this whole chunk. So this is this is a good, actually a good exercise here. This is poorly written, plain and simple. But we have some code now we'd like to call uh, in a more generic fashion. So this, some of this logic is stuff we need to call from other place. Don't just copy and paste it. That's a terrible thing to do. Um, so let's just quickly look at all of this code and figure out what do we need to do here? Okay, so did they select it? Yes, they did. So let's now set the product number. Let's set the description to match. Let's set the price to match. Let's set the quantity available to equal to the product quantity in stock. Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, if this quantity available is that, uh, do we want to back order or no for cancel? Okay, because we're doing these things as, as faster operations, I don't want to be doing all of this stuff, um, uh, but we could potentially want to want to eventually do this and, oh, okay, well, we're now using these products we want to back order them, but what we should do is we should have some kind of a, a concept of saying what is the default, and if the default's not set, then it needs to ask. Uh, so we could uh, we can make that assumption. Uh, so then this is just saying how do we want to handle that, and then uh, if this one of that request equals change record, so there so this stuff is going to be based upon whether we are changing an existing product, which does not apply in this, in, in our new case. Uh, so we could probably just ignore that code. And then if the product description is blank, then we wanna clear the price and call lookup again. That, what in the heck? And then we select quantity ordered. Okay, well, whatever. Uh, okay, so what we're gonna do is, I think personally that this code is specific to the form. I don't think it really applies to what we're doing and needing in our case. What we want is we want the priming logic. So we're going to call prime um, detail for product or from product there, from product. And we're gonna leave it just like that. Uh, and then we're gonna grab 
that and grab this. Um, and then we're going to create, let's go to calls. And then we're going to create a new procedure called prime detail from product add there. This is going to be a source procedure, templates, source. And it's going to have a prototype. It's going to have an optional parameter that's, that's called um, um, uh, automatically, oh, let's go byte pool, automatically, automatic, auto back order. Or how about this? Let's not make it bool. Let's make it. Um, um, let's make it a string. Back order. Actually, you know what? No, I want it to be bool. Bool is fine. Uh, bool. I think it's. I think back order is fine. Okay. Uh, bool, of course, is short for boolean. And then the code that it's going to do is this. Now, uh, what we're going to do is we have to create some variable that's going to store that so that the code will compile. So, and it's going to be like, because it's assigning from this, we can make it like that guy. Lovely. Um, and then da -da -da -da. here's product description. What in the world's this? Where is this used? Odd. Okay. Um, weird. Okay. I can only assume that it's being used on that form, but let's create a variable here. In fact, let's copy that entire line. I don't know why it's doing that, um, but uh, but it's doing that. We'll have to tweak that a little bit because that product description thing needs to be coming back to it. So we may have to change our um, our um, calling procedure. Uh, da -da -da. Okay, uh, or the and the parameter the prototype, and and this is why I say don't write your code in the embed so it's stuck there. Write it in such a way that it's separate because trying to come up come in after the fact and untangle this mess is not something anybody wants to do. Uh, so this will be a, a very handy. Uh, uh, lesson for, for those who, uh, who think that it's perfectly fine to do it that way. You recognize that, oh, uh, things uh, run into, into a problem, potentially. Uh, display, sure, why not? Um, uh, the, if quantity available equals this, now what we want is we want this thing to uh, optionally do this. So we're gonna say, uh, the logic itself is if it's yes, if it's no, if it's insert record, request can't, oh my goodness. Oh, the, okay. Um, so we are going to specify here that a button no request insert record. Uh, oh dear. <laughs> oh my goodness, okay. Um, so we can do this. Yeah, you know what? I, I think the way we're calling this, we have to approach it a little differently. I was hoping to just take the entire chunk and do it as is, but this is a lot of stuff it's doing here. So uh, let, let's tweak this a little bit. Let's um, go, I think we're still gonna get it working here, but not quite the way I was hoping. Let's just go a uh, uh, description uh, string string uh, description. Uh, so you'll notice that I'm calling it in as a reference parameter, star string. So I'm gonna pass in something that's gonna be set and, and brought back. Uh, da -da, and then uh, I'm gonna uppercase this just for fun. And then I'm gonna have it call, uh, have a return a byte. Okay, so this is gonna work a little better. And I it was a product description, you know, it lets you use the same terminology, product description. There. 
So that makes this go away. And then if we wanted to uh, do this thing, we're going to say, da, 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 da. now we're going to say, uh, if uh, back order, if back order, yeah, you know what, we're going to make it a little better here. If emitted back order, we're going to ask, answer this. Um, Hmm, really want to do this. The trick here is we've got user interaction that we want to automate and to figure out what is the standard stuff. And here they're doing things like, okay, they're going to the quantity ordered field so that they can, so back ordered, and this is on the detail record, they're back ordering it. For this, uh, yes for back order, no for cancel out of stock. Select order options, yes, no. So all it's doing is set the back ordered button. Otherwise, quantity available price. Low quantity available, quantity in stock. I don't know, this is a mess. Okay, you know what, let's, let's, let's just count this up as a perfect lesson for why you don't want to put too much of this user interface code in amongst your business logic code. Make your business logic a callable thing and then make your interface logic tie into the business logic as in two independent concepts. Don't monkey with making the two together at the same time because then if you ever want to reuse it, you get into a mess like this. Uh, now, in my opinion, this is a particularly egregious screw up in terms of an example of, of how this is uh, done here. Uh, but I have certainly seen this out in the wild um, in, in other app people's applications. And th this is not the worst example I've seen. Um, so I don't think we're going to get it to this point here. Uh, but what I think we will do is we'll just assume that this doesn't even exist as a concept. Really what we wanted, we wanted these things here. And quantity ordered quantity order, that's really what I really wanted to get is what are these things supposed to be? And we're gonna back all this stuff out. So we're gonna get rid of this procedure and we're going to go uh, calls and we're gonna get rid of that procedure and then we're gonna delete the module and we're gonna come back here. And where was that? It was called uh, da, 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 da. It was called. Da, da, da. Where is it? I'm trying to find it here. A little ways back. Copy. Prime detail from product is what we called it. Prime detail from product. And we're going to go back and we're going to get rid of that and we're going to put it back to what it was. There. I hate that. That really, really bothers me. Um, and then we're going to go back to our other thing and modified and go browse orders and this. And then we're creating our order. And it was in this spot where uh, we wanted this code here. Uh, quantity ordered is going to be one still. Uh, detail. Product. Some kind of description thing in here somewhere. Where is it? Just looking for a string. Why weren't we seeing the string description? There is no string in here. That's just wonky. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to do the product number in here. 
the product description. Oh, there is a product description. There it is. Okay. Uh, and product price. Okay. Now, the reason I'm, you're saying, well, hold on, wait, you're clearing the detail and then you're setting all these fields and then you're telling it to prime the record, really? And the answer is yes, really, because prime record is this wonderful thing in ABC that automatically deals with my auto numbering. And I just wanted to do that. So I'm so I really I'm clearing it and then priming all the fields that I want to prime and then say, OK, hold on to everything except for the auto sequencing that, that I want you to do. Uh, and this is just the easiest way to do it. So. Yeah, lovely. Um, let's see if this works. A little better than it did last time. Unknown product. Well, OK. Well, I was kind of wondering about that. Okay. Okay, let's get rid of that for now. Let's go uh, customers, orders, and let's create a new order and let's go this one and this one and this one, select. And it should create another one. And that looks much better, there. So you'll notice that all of them are set to not back order, but we, what we could theoretically do is we could have had it be smart enough to say, Oh, uh, I don't even have one of these things. I, I, I can't do that. Uh, and then automatically set it to back order and set the quantity order to zero. Um, that's something you could have potentially done in the, in the code. Um, but for the time being, uh, that's, the way it's, uh, that's the way it's working. So we've now got to a nice easy spot of handling this. Uh, and the, the neat thing is we've got this little embed thing that does it for us. We've got all this initialization code. Uh, the next step up, is to think how could we have tweaked this a little bit further so that it's more interactive. And the thing that I wanna do there is I'm going to tweak uh, our select thing just for the sake of showing you how that can be done. So what I wanted to do is in select products, I'm gonna make the window a little wider here and we're going to take a look in here at, just going to search for the word after. No, that might not do. Yeah, let's look, for, search for the single. That might be a better one. There we go. After single tag. I suddenly realized we were going to have 800 uh, iterations of the word after, but after a single tag operation. And we actually made actually wanted to say after any tag, because there's one of those two, but this is the one we want to find first. So what happens is every single time somebody does a tag, individually tags a record, untags a record, flips a record um, uh, for, for the tagging, uh, the, it, each of those single tagging operations, uh, tagging one record, uh, we'll call this. And it's useful to, to, to know that this is being called and then you can uh, do this operation. Um, there's also another thing called after any tag. Uh, but I think it's important that we recognize that uh, single tags are a little different than multi tags. Any tag, and there are sometimes you want to do something after everybody tagged anything, just, just go out and do this bulk operation. But I'd rather do it as a, as a, uh, as a single tag here. Uh, so we're going to start here with just a little bit of code. You'll notice what it's doing is it's saying if, if the record was tagged, uh, or if the record is currently tagged, then the tag icon is that, it's this. Um, and then it makes sure that the queue is set up with the proper tagging state. So it displays it properly. So it does the right icon and then it puts the queue. Um, so we now know that the record is gonna be in memory, the queue record is gonna be in memory and the tag is properly set. So what we wanna do is we wanna say uh, if tag, which means the person has said they want this product. I want to go over and I want to create a queue of all of the products that are currently tagged. So uh, that means I'm actually going to create a queue structure. So I want to create a queue structure just so it can have a nice looking queue here. So let's call, um, uh, what can we call it? Uh, 
order product queue. There we go, order detail queue. Uh, and then uh, we could just call it ODQ, but let's call it that. It's gonna be a queue and it's going to have the um, product uh, number like product product number and it's going to be um, let's have the product name here like Carol colon it's a product disc description is it it's a called uh, description let's call it just description Nah, I better call it product because this thing, this is the order detail queue. So we better know that it's product description. That's enough to start with. Okay, so it's gonna say, if this record is tagged, then what I wanna do is I wanna say, uh, order detail queue, queue uh, dot product number equals, uh, my product, product number, get, and then let's just copy this thing here. So I'm just saying, okay, I wanna fetch a record for my order detail queue. And I wanna say if error code, um, meaning we couldn't get it, now we have to clear the order detail queue and then we're going to set this field here and we're gonna set the other field as well. So we're gonna get the product description at the same time. Product like here. And there's that. Uh, so we created it, yay. Good. Oh, and one more thing. And add the record using the product number, uh, sure, product number, or maybe the product description, doesn't really matter. Uh, the thing that's interesting here is this get operation has to use the product number because it's a unique ID, but the add could add the record in whatever order it wants because this is for display order. And it can, and, and Clarion is quite able to handle one, you know, the, the gets doesn't ha don't have to, uh, use the same order as the queue happens to be currently sorted in. It doesn't care. Uh, so just for fun, let's say product description. So that's the first half, else. Uh, and we're gonna do something similar here. And really what I should be doing is I should be taking this these lines of code and creating a little thing called fetch. Well, why do I do that? Let's say fetch uh, order ODQ. Let's call it ODQ just for fun. Procedure and it's long. I think this is long, isn't it? Yep, a long product number. And then we're gonna say uh, code. And then we need these two lines of code here, uh, there, and then you say return, choose, error code equals no error, uh, level benign, otherwise level notify, notify. So what'll happen here is uh, it'll do the fetch and then if it was no error, then it's benign. Otherwise it's notify and now it's using the standard uh, equates that, uh, that Clarion likes to use for those things. Let us take this and put it down here in local procedures. Uh, there. Fetch ODQ. Now we're going to take this up here and let's put it in the map. Map. There. Done. So now this is a local procedure map. I've created a little map within this procedure itself and I can define any procedures I want. Uh, if I find out I'm getting a bunch of these, maybe we'll eventually turn it into a class. Uh, and then we could just convert that over easily to a class. But for the moment, we are doing this. So there's that. Oop. 
So now in here, we're going to say if fetch ODQ and we want that equals level benign. If this is, oh, sorry, is not equal to level benign. We'll want. And then we can do this, da, 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 fetch that, clear that, uh, add that record. And then similarly, we're going to say here, now we can say if this, because we've just untagged a record, it's not currently tagged, we wanna make sure that thing's deleted. So we're gonna say if it is level benign, then we wanna say delete order detail queue. And let's grab our little queue structure, get it out of here, doesn't belong there. Now, we wanna see what's inside of this queue. So let's go ahead and um, create a, um, what's it called? Uh, we're gonna create a list control and we're going to explicitly use this thing. This thing isn't even defined in our local data. We don't care. Uh, it's in local data here, but it's not in local data over in our data pad, but that's fine. We don't care about that. We're just gonna grab that thing there. So we're gonna go over to here, our window structure. We've got this space here. Let's go ahead to the toolbox and we want a list box and we're just gonna pop it right here. And let's just expand that out a little bit. And then we're gonna go list box, oops, cancel list box format. And we're going to, it's gonna say, well, what are you showing me here? It doesn't really matter what we specify as far as the fields here. We, you can just grab anything. Let's just put product description, sure. Um, the point is we're going to specify it. Let me come back to here for a second and properties. It is order detail list. And now we are going to say we want to go from a particular queue and we're just going to go from the order detail queue. So it's just going to grab that automatically from the thing I've defined in hand code. This is the use variable for it. Now back to our list box formatting here. So I've told it I want the product description, but it's really not the product description. It's going to assume it's the first field from the queue, but I don't want the first field from the queue. I actually want the second field from the queue. Oops, second field. Uh, so this is one option to do it. Um, and go here and, oh, you know, let's just make that look a little nicer indent. There we go. It's good enough. And data indent. Yeah, I'll make it two, sure. That's better. Lovely. Beautiful. Okay. Now this should actually work. So we're going to, let's just see if it actually did work. Uh, customers, orders, pretend we're gonna add something, tag something. There we go, look at that, amazing. So and now if we take away this middle one, it's gonna disappear, it did, look at that, amazing. So this is kind of cool. Uh, so all we're doing at this point is every single time we do a single tag operation, whether it's tagging one, untagging one, flipping one, uh, it automatically uh, goes in and it says, well, if you've just tagged something, I better make sure it's in the list. If you didn't tag something, I'm gonna take it away from the list, which is kind of a fun little thing. Uh, and, and then it creates this queue record. Now, if we wanted to, it wouldn't be a big deal for us to add a quantity field, a default quantity and uh, whatever other fields we wanted here. And then we could come over here and we could even then say, okay, I wanna select this thing. And then we could attach some kind of an operation to it. Uh, and, uh, and then preset a lot of these things. Personally, I think it's enough just to say, here's the collection of things create the order and then go on and tweak the order. But in some cases, perhaps you want to, uh, you want to sort of predefine some of these things as they there. That is really the way I want it to look now. 
create that as the official order rather than doing a lot of that editing over in your normal ordering ordering facility because maybe you don't want to create the order until you actually know it's the way you want it to look uh, because once you create an order somehow it becomes more concrete in your system and that maybe it starts getting processed right away and you don't want it to get processed right away but you want to be able to specify a bunch of the stuff associated with those details before you actually lock it in stone and say there the order is officially done so this can be almost a pre-ordering system or a, or an order order would add whatever you want to call it um and and the interesting thing is the uh, the one customer of mine who asked me how should he do this initially i suggested he do this and then i said just add a button on here that says change delete whatever um and using the queue and he got and he said no i've got a much better idea i'm going to use the memory file so he created a memory file in his dictionary and instead of creating records in the queue he created records in his memory file uh, that corresponded to, to those same entries but then as soon as he had memory file suddenly the browse class could browse the memory file he he decided he wanted to use edit in place on this same thing to uh, to update all of the aspects of his order and then once he was finally done he had a little button down here that says go boom that is what i want it to be uh, and, and it handled that just fine let's take one final piece here uh where we go through and we say um da -da -da. so there's that uh, there was the after multi tag. So I, I copy this down. I don't even know, know if I'm going to need this code at all. Um, and what I really should do is I should do things like adding one and deleting one. In fact, that's a great idea. Let's create a, I'm going to change this now. Class, uh, ODQ class. Uh, or, you know, let's call order detail class. And then let's call this um, fetch. Uh, and then fetch is just going to be like that. And then we're going to have um, something called uh, add. And then delete. Let's do that. Sure, that's lovely. Uh, so now we got to go down to here, and this is going to be called odq dot fetch. Odq dot add. Oh, sorry, order details. What we're calling it? Order detail. Order detail. Fetch. Um. While well, we're at it, let's go after single tag. Now we really get into this concept of, of saying, okay, I don't want my code to be stuck up in, inside of all those other embeds. I'd rather see all the logic for it here in this one place. So do this here, here, and I go up to that other spot we were at. So now we're going to say uh, order detail after single tag. We need that function up here. Taking all this code down to here. If tag, I'm going to say self dot fetch, and then I'm going to say self dot add. And then here we're going to say self. Actually, you know what? Yeah, do I like that? No. You know what? I'm going to have um, even more so. I'm going to go here and here. And then you're going to say delete. So what I've just done here is I've changed this to be I'm just going to grab this here while we're at it just because we're going to add an after multi tag after multi tag
Okay, so after single tag, it says, well, if it was tagged, then I want to make sure that it's there. Um, um, and if it's uh, and if it's not tagged, then I want to make sure it's gone. Uh, so that's the way that's going to happen. So what do we do when we're adding it? Well, we make sure that it's not there. So if it's not there, then it goes ahead and adds it. If it's already there, it just leaves it there. Um, when we delete it, is it there? If it is, then delete it. Good. So that's nice, simple logic. So this tells a nice story. If it's tagged, then add it. Otherwise, delete it. And then it's smart enough to deal with it accordingly. Similarly, now we're going to have this and we're going to do all the tags. So to handle this thing properly, what we really have to do is we have to process all the records in our uh, in our thing here. So we're going to go in and find out what is the uh, browse called. Da, 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 da. Where is it? This window? Nope. Toolbar there. What a query. Okay. Browse class. Here we go. Um, and I'm trying to remember here. What is the standard way of doing this? Oh gosh. Um, you know, I'm just checking the time here. You know what? We're at quarter to two. What I was just going to do is I was going to write the code here uh, to just walk through all the records using the browse logic. Uh, you essentially have uh, reset and then do a bunch of nexts, this kind of thing. Uh, loop while that dot next. Uh, and then we're going to say if. Um, and then depending upon whether records that we could say if get tag um, colon ptrm et product um, here uh, product product number there self dot add there that's essentially the code I'm not sure if this is going to we might have to test this to make sure it works uh, delete. And maybe you start out with, well, no, you don't want to leave it like that. Um, yeah, that would be fine. Good. So that's essentially the code there is you reset the, you, you reset the browse and then th for every single browse record, um, if it's tagged, if it's, you know, then go ahead and make sure that our queue has that thing added. Otherwise make sure the queue has the thing deleted. Uh, and then when all is said and done, it will be automatically updated. Uh, there might be a bit more, it might be a reset queue or something like that, or reset uh, view, or so I, but I think just reset is probably sufficient there. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, that's the, the, the essential logic that you need so that it automatically does that. And then as I say, there's the extra stuff of having a button to say, now that I'm done all my stuff, go over and create those records, much like we did in the other procedure where we were just saying for all the tagged records, go ahead and do this, except now we've got them sitting in a queue or in the case of this one customer of mine, uh, he had them sitting in a memory table. Uh, lots and lots of flexibility here. The point is in tagging, you've got all kinds of building blocks that can do that kind of stuff. Uh, it's like a Meccano set. Put it together however you want. Clarion's amazing that way. And the nice thing about tagging is it's got all of these facilities added on in terms of where the tags stored, fetching the tags, what's the status of the tags. It does all the tagging operations on screen for you. So all of those mechanics are done and available. And then it's just a matter of what are you gonna do with them? And really the sky's the limit. And with that, I shall call this topic done. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions. I'm going to stop sharing for the moment here. Uh, and there was the one Q and A. Can super tagging be used in a Noantis report control? Uh, I don't know if they can or not. That's a good question. I, I would say probably not, at least not as is, but I know the Noantis report control does automatically just grab everything from an existing list control. So it, what it would really come down to is you might have to write a little bit of glue in terms of having the Noantis report control like when you click on a checkbox in the report control, it would then have to go through and and uh, and just call the tagging stuff in the background, much like it would if you if you normally did a tag operation. And but at that point, then you, what you probably would end up doing is you'd probably end up just calling like the set tag get tag operations directly, um, uh, so that they could manage that piece of it. But I don't see any reason why. You, that couldn't be made to happen. Again, all the pieces are in the box and you, there are so many options as far as how you use it, but there, there's no template 
I've created specifically to say, now that you're using a Niantas report control, I will automatically tie all that together, that stuff together. But it's worth having a, a discussion with uh, with Andy uh, to see what pieces would be missing, because I would assume that there'd be very little that is necessary to make all that stuff work just fine. But I've never had anybody ask me that, interestingly enough. So first person. So I made it. I made it work with a Net Talk web server. Yeah. Well. Well, that's the thing. You know. That's is, pretty cool. Is the, the, oh yeah. Like you said, all the pieces are there, right? Yeah. Exactly. Very cool. So John, do we have enough time to, to, to look at that? You had something you wanted to show me. We do. It'll be very quick anyway, because it's, I found, I found bugs in it when I was uh, launching ah, it just to test oh, it before wow. I showed it. So <laughs> we'll see, we'll see things that I broke uh, yesterday evening. I've been working on, on this one, this one thing for like a week and it's still not quite right, but it's very, very close. So I, I'll, I'll show it. I'll show it. Okay, so I changed the name to models. That, nice. That's a week. That's a week right there, just nice. to get the word models. Yeah, I know that. That's a, that's a that's a hard thing. That was a big thing because <laughs> I kept misspelling <laughs> it. Uh, no, <laughs> um, I got all the groups working. Groups and everything is working as far as groups go, and being able to sort them and be able to do. Oh, what did I do here? Yeah, so this test classes is a group, so this folder's in there. Yep. Um, these individual items are in this Ultimates one. Noyantis has their own stuff in there. So you can do things like that. You can group them, or you can have an entire folder and, and group it with a, a Clarion. Nice. So that, that's all working. That's all working. <clears throat> Excuse me, but this is the new thing, is this. this. There's okay. five uh -huh. empty Interesting. panels, I guess, where you can put... Uh, your classes. And I probably can make it so that these can come up on the fly. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not sure how to do it. I'll have to check with Andy on that. And he was going to do something in the template where you could do that. You, you, you've done work with this, Mike, where you can add docking panes. Because these are all but, docking uh, panes. To tell you the truth, it's been years since I've worked. Yeah, it's been a while. With that, with that part of the stuff, yeah. yeah. Right. So um, in the meantime, I just created five of them. For you to put things into yeah 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 sure and they're all docking panes so uh this is where i have some things that are still a little broken let's look at them here and working out the interface was fun because i had different yeah. ideas on how to do it and then it was like man eh, maybe not and that so what i what i basically came up to is that whatever you see on the screen is what's going to be filled hmm. all right so <clears throat> sorry so i click on parameters here and it's filled up with parameters and it changes the name of the tab Right. So you know what's there, right? And mm -hmm. if I click here, it should, yeah. So now it's Gatekeeper, and that's filled in. Yep. And here, back, back to parameters. Now I want, I want to lock this one. So I have a lock. Oh, so nice. lock it, right? And now, now if I click on something else, nothing changes here. Hmm, okay. okay. I can't see anything. So I want to, I want to, I want to do something. Well, now, what would be really nice is, is if you click on different things, that it just progressively well yeah I, I see what you mean though if you're just browsing around you don't necessarily want it to stick right and this is so, where i'm having some issue because it's not updating now and it should be it should be updating this one so, so yeah. what i what would be nice is if you could have a little pin in your tab itself um, you know what I'm saying? So, so basically whatever you click on will show up the tab shows up and it's there and then if right. you pin it in the tab itself, not necessarily in that lock button, but if you had a tab, a pin on the tab, and then clicked on something else, it would automatically open another one there. So you can mm -hmm. pin whatever. You, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I can. I mean, maybe if I select the tab. Yeah, I just I don't sure know if I can say I'm going to click on the have pin. Things in the, yeah, I don't know if you can have like yeah. a clickable pin in the tab. I'd be surprised if you can't, because it would seem that this has got to be something that it's done it's a dock somewhere so i don't i don't yeah. know oh, but i, I do when it's locked it changes them to red mm -hmm. see these are red now these are green which means that they're empty or you know will, will be updated yeah. but I'm, I'm losing my updating ability here i was doing some work on on comments and it uh, broke this other stuff so 
But anyway, uh, so I wanted to show you that, that you got five yeah, that's cool. things no, you can do. And even if, like this, that's cool. I would change, by the way, the, the lock thing mm -hmm. from green to uh, change it to be the green pin and the red pin. So when you lock it, it would change to a red pin. It does. When I lock it, it changes to red. No, no, no. I'm saying your lock button, it's your lock icon oh, is here? different than the pin. Yeah. So you should coordinate oh. those two sets of icons, either oh, in, the, in the tab itself, have it be the lock. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and then that's one option is, is, uh, is uh, you could just have it I'm, not have any icon. And then as soon as you lock it, it would show the lock all of a sudden. Potentially. I, try, I tried the lock up here, but it was too small. And so it just okay. looked like a blobby thing. Especially if it was unlocked, it wouldn't, you couldn't really tell. Right. So that's why I went with the pin, but I, I can, you know, work on that a little bit. I yeah. was quite happy when it changed colors. I thought it looked Yeah, that's nice. neat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I like that. Yeah, and, um, and that's a big improvement because ultimately if you have more than five classes, you're looking at the same time, you're down the rabbit hole. But, yeah, I, but at the same time, time, you've got lots more room for more tabs. So yeah, it, I, it, I uh, do. Well, it does take up room when you put the names in, but yeah, not too yeah. much. Uh, so then anyway, you can do stuff like, I could take this and move it down here. Oh, neat. And then I could take this and do the same thing. That. Nice. And then I could take this and move it. Uh, let's move it there. There. Oh my goodness. So... <laughs> So now I've got them side by side where I could look at, at different things on yeah. either side if I needed to with two different things. Neat. Ultimate notify is over yeah, here. Yeah, that, that that's, that's quite handy. Yeah, yeah. Here. yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And, you, and obviously it's stocking paintings, right? So you can move them anywhere, yeah, yeah. anywhere yeah, exactly. you want. I'm not sure if you, I don't think cool. I can load it. No. It won't by the way, I, I wouldn't put dot ink. I would strip the dot ink off when you put the, put it in the tab. I just make an ultimate. Oh, up here? Yeah, I agree. You'll take, yeah. take care of that. Minor. So that's it. That's the cool new thing that's coming. That, that's pretty good. That, that is a big jump forwards, John. That, that, that adds a great deal because it's rare that I'm just looking at one class and I hate screen switching. You know, that's yeah. why I've got three massive monitors in front of me because I don't want to have to alt tab into anything because as soon as I do, my brain goes, I've forgotten a little bit of what I was just looking at. And I, if, the more I can have on the screen all at the same time, the better. Well, now it's changing. So see, now I'm changing this one. They're side by side. So if you just mm -hmm. set up two of them side by side, then you could look at two different things. Mm -hmm. And that, that I know like Andy's classes, he has a common class and then he has the actual class. And no. to look at both of those, this would be a lot easier to be able to mm. do it just like this. So, yeah, there you go. Very cool. I like it. That's where we are. So um, I should have it working a little better this, this, next, this weekend, I guess. Maybe I'll do uh, an update next Friday or the Friday after and go through it. Plus sure. the, the ultimate parameters, I did work on that. Uh, it does some nice things as far as Oh, I added some new methods. What did I add in here? Oh, see what it did when I clicked here? It was already open, so it just shows the tab that it's on. Oh, nice. See? That's why it moved. So this is ultimate DB ink. Is it going to move over? Yeah, see, it moved over. So it says, hey, I'm already open. Now you want to see that. So that's what it did. Neat. How neat is that? That is pretty uh, cool. This. Get all field value pairs. And sending and receiving this this lists out all of your field value pairs <laughs> it shows huh. you all the fields and all the values that are in them as you're sending them and every and it's huh. uh you'll do it per procedure or you see all of them that are going across all the procedures so that way because that was a, kind of an objection you had is like you don't know what's flying around all over the place right this lets you know what's flying around all over the place <laughs> It, it's it sends it out to debug. It just goes into a nice string and sends it out to debug, and and that's uh, that's what it does. Uh, well, so that's uh, nice. Yeah, I I still ultimately am am a little little perturbed, but uh, I know you're perturbed on it. But I'm but what I'm using this a lot for is this sending notifications from this thread to this thread to this thread. Everything that you're seeing here is on separate threads. Yeah, no, I understand. So when I click here, it's got to you know find this thread or find this tab is what that did to yeah. send thread notifications to it and whatever so i'm just i'm just using the this ultimate parameters to put things in and send it over 
And so it's yeah. just making groups on the fly. It's kind of I, I understand, and I, I guess my biggest concern with it, John, is the 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 lack of um, formalism. Um, because what I find is, if you let people be sloppy, they will be sloppy. And when people are sloppy, then you come back in after the fact and you can't make sense of it. You know, it's much like this invoice app that we're looking at us going, what a bunch of horrible decisions they made. And it's so locked in stone now that you may as well just rewrite the whole app because there's no easy way to refactor that code to be, to have less, you know, more separation of concerns. Uh, there's right. just so much stuff all mashed together. Um, and, and when you kind of approach it as, okay, there's a certain set of, guidelines and rules and best practices and if you follow those yes it takes a little bit more effort up front but down the road you end up with something that is not only easier to maintain it's easier to reuse etc cetera, etc cetera. and and the more you make it possible to just quickly throw something together the more you make it more difficult to fix it later and that that's my biggest concern with using any kind of a tool is well just look at look at how easily i can throw this together that, that's not the point. It's right. like the concept of look at look look at how short I can make my variable names. That's so much faster. No, it's terrible. Make your variable names longer so that when you look at the code later, you know what it's doing. That kind right. of thing. So well, that's why I added in this ability to look and see what what's going on behind the scenes. What's and in the, that queue? And, and I can and see the, it in the debug. I can see how it happens. And the first image that popped into my mind when you said that, and and just to give you an idea as to how much. This rankles me. I went to a restaurant one time in, in, in Toronto. I can't remember what kind of it was. might have been a Chinese restaurant or Indian restaurant or something, but it was one of the one of the little Indias or little something in Toronto. And I went downstairs to the bathroom and I looked at the, the door of the, the bathroom stall and I don't know what was on the bathroom stall, but it was covered with flies in a shape. And I just kind of went, whoa. And I just kind of went like this and the whole door went. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and the concept of with this little thing, you can see all the stuff that's in there. And I just got this image of like flies. <laughs> so much noise you're going to see inside of this thing that is it really useful? You know, it's, it's um, yeah, it is very useful. If you've got, a, if you've got a mess, you've got a mess. As, as I guess the, the point, uh, the point I can make here. So. But yes, that was a very frightening scene. And that was the first scene that popped into my head when you said, and this thing will show everything that's flying around. I'm like, no, it flies, no. <laughs> it goes into your debug. I mean, you can debug it or not debug it. No, I understand. Or you can write it to a text file if you want and look at it later. I mean, there's, there's, it's, I, all I can tell you is that this has been very helpful to me as yeah, I'm writing. No, 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 all I this get what stuff. you're saying, John. It, it, it can be a good tool. I just, as I say, and anything that, yeah. that allows, quick and easy uh, unstructured ways of doing things is inherently dangerous. That's Isn't all. that where we're all moving toward though? No. We have like, things like no SQL where you just throw things out there and crack that. Yeah, Isn't yeah, that yeah. what we want? No, no. It, no? It, 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 people, <laughs> That's okay, not what you want. Let me put it this way. We all, all want right. a simple button. But as you know, anytime it says, well, it, this should be easy. Isn't it just a something? Oh, no, 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 don't say that. Because you know, as soon as you hear that expression is, isn't it just a something? You know, you're going to have to explain to this person, the world is a complex place. And the only way we can make sure that it stays kind of good is to have structures in place that help us to understand it. Abstractions that help to keep the complexity in nicely contained boxes. Uh, and, uh, and if you just let people just throw whatever into whatever box, you know, you walk into a garage where somebody's just thrown whatever they want into whatever box and try and find something in that garage, it's an impossibility. Wait a minute, you just described my closet. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the point. Yeah, that's the point, John. <laughs> There's no structure there. <laughs> yeah, without structure, you're, you're never going to go back and resume something because everything has to become a one off. You know, there's, okay. you're, you're constantly right. patching and patching and patching and because you can't make sense of anything. I still say there's a, I, I, there's a, there's a use for that. But yeah, so it lets you be I'm sloppy for quicker. I'm not being sloppy at all. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'll show, <laughs> I'll, I'll show you the code. We'll do another unboxing. We'll do a reboxing. How's that? Right. Re-unboxing. Right. I don't know. I don't know. See if I can get you and we'll, we'll, we'll look at this code next time. But I, I do like understand the, the allure of quick and dirty. I mean, I'm taking Emphasis on board on what you're dirty. telling me. I'm trying to make it a little more, okay. Okay. you know, I, I know you'll never use it ever, but mm. uh, maybe mm. things change. 
All righty. <laughs> All right, that. that's it. That was it. That was the drama. And look, we have eight likes. See, that's you throw in the drama. Yeah, and that, people well, are that, liking it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, like oftentimes, uh, in, in, as you know, I'm in Toastmasters, and and, and mm -hmm. one of the things that I often stress to people is, if you recognize that people love stories, they they, they, they are associated with stories, and part of why they like stories is you say, here's the situation, and then something terrible happened, and then they resolved it, and if you don't have kind of that that twist in the middle that that uh, conflict situation it's not a very good story people want the drama and they want to see that there's a real resolution to the drama um and in in the same way uh, if we want to get our likes we have to fight more often i guess <laughs> you have to have more fights right here in clary <laughs> life <laughs> all right but i still well, love you john so there you go oh, you're my best you're you're my bestie you know that uh, like um let's go yeah. So remember, nothing Monday. I'm not even gonna throw up the last slide because there's just question marks. That's all there is there. It's no, just no, question no. marks. You can just keep that in your head. Um, yeah. Anyway, nothing on Monday. Nothing on Thursday. But we'll be at the open webinar, I guess. We'll see who shows up. I yeah. don't know. You gonna show up, Mike? I, I should be here. Can. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be here. Okay. Cool. And then we'll uh, do something next Friday, or, or or not. Or maybe maybe Mike and I will fight next Friday. Yeah. <laughs> Get our boxing gloves. <laughs> oh, and good. dress up as a Joker or something. <laughs> I've got a I've got a, a Batman costume. Uh, you do? Really? Oh, that's that's an amazing. <laughs> Have you ever seen it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, that's it. Blow wave. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Have a great weekend. Happy Easter and all that. And bye. Record.